Dialog Society is a registered charity. We were established in 1999, and our aim is to, commit, uh, is to promote community cohesion by connecting communities through dialogue. So a lot of our work is actually to do with communities and events across London, as well as the UK, is attend different marches that we have. And these events are really about bringing people together. They're about sharing, engaging, learning about one another, conversation and social interaction and projects that you can do together um, within your communities. But alongside our community work, we also run a lot of courses and workshops as well, and Successful is just one of those um, programs. And we know through experience um, that you need confidence and psychic skills to be able to engage in dialogue, and so we believe that these courses will help equip young people like yourself with those skills, as well as the confidence to be able to engage with others. So the Successful program in particular looks at what are the barriers to success and how we can overcome them. By identifying what those barriers are, it gives us one step closer to how we can overcome those obstacles that we're all facing. And these barriers can be anything from economic barriers, from the, your, your backgrounds, it could be cultural barriers, so it could be that the, the, the family that you've been raising can maybe restrict you to particular or certain professions and maybe not give you the opportunity to explore things outside of that remit, it could be family barriers, whereas, for example, you might be expected to continue in a particular family-run bu business um, and not being given the opportunity to expand your horizons further. Not that that's a bad thing, but in terms of what your own uh, abilities and what you want to do in terms of your own uh, future goals, that might be a restriction or a barrier. Your ethnicity, your religion, your gender, these can all act as barriers for you. But most importantly, I think, our own personal barriers we need to overcome, and they could be anything from lack of confidence, lack of self-esteem, lack of self-belief in not being able to continue or do the work that we believe that we should be able to do. Can I just say for the benefit of our students, this lady is talking about snakes and ladders. That's our version of it, how we deal with snakes and ladders, which have to go up the ladders and go, and what can help you push down. So, so you guys get the part of that. So we don't be looking at um, our, our goal in terms of the, the board game, snakes and ladders. So up until now, we've had uh, several sessions with um, uh, for the successful, and unfortunately, we've come to the end of the program. So today is our very last session with David. In the past, we've had uh, performance coaches that have come along. We've had Robert Kelsey, who's uh, an award-winning author of the book What's Stopping You, who's, who's come to deliver his session on ways in which you can overcome um, your own personal barriers. We've had Nikki Clark, who's known as one of the best hairdressers and a pioneer within the hairdressing industry. Um, and also the founder of Nikki Clark salons and, and hair product ranges. We've had Serena Bradshaw who's come along, um, who's a performance coach and looked at the winning formula and developing mental toughness. We've had Andy Barrow, a triple Paralympian, three-time European gold medalist who was a professional wheelchair rugby player for Great Britain and also represented the, uh, the UK in the 2012 Olympics. I personally found his story to be incredibly inspiring. Um, again, all of these events, all of our past programs are on our website, the videos are there, so if you haven't been able to attend the previous sessions, please do go, um, if you have the opportunity to, to watch those videos, because they really are uh, amazing stories that, you can, um, that we can all benefit from. Um, and finally, I uh, just want to say thank you to all of you for coming today. Um, we've come to the end of the program, but we do hope to repeat this uh, each year. This is the fifth year that we've been doing successful, so I'm hoping that we'll have many more um, sessions to come and, and hopefully uh, we'll be seeing you in future events as well. Uh, on a final note, I just want to say thank you to all of our uh, speakers because they genuinely, we're very, very grateful for them to come along. Uh, they, they are all here on a voluntary basis. Many of them do public speaking and sessions like this professionally, so people my age will probably have to pay to listen to them. But we really do appreciate the fact that they're here on a voluntary basis, which means that we can actually run this event for free so that as many young people can uh, attend as possible. Um, so again, thank you to you and thank you to our um, today's speaker and previous speakers as well. If I could please, on a final note, before I introduce David, please ask if you could fill in your questionnaires. They really are important for us and hand them back because it's your feedback and your um, ideas, criticism that we, uh, will mean we can see if we're achieving our objectives and our targets um, and also look at ways in how we can improve the programme. So without further
further ado, uh, I would like to introduce David, uh, who is the author of six books, including his storybook, which was published in 2010. He's a script writer, story consultant, lecturer, and PhD scholar of story theory, whose research is changing the way contemporary media industries create and evaluate stories. In his story research uh, theory research, he's included and worked with great names in film, publishing, TV and theatre, and just to name a few examples, including Bob Gale, who was the writer and producer of Back to the Future series, which was something I was very fond of with Michael J. Fox when I was in my younger years, she says. John Sullivan, a TV comedy writer of Only Fools and Horses and Just Good Friends. Willie Russell, who's a theatre legend and writer of Blood Brothers and Shirley Valentine. Lee Child, author of the Jack Reacher novels. And Mark Williams, the actor who played Arthur Weasley in Harry Potter, Shakespeare in Love, and, and many others, which I'm sure David will expand upon during the time of, uh, course of the interview. He also delivers seminars on story principles for training and script development organizations. He works as a story consultant for film, theater, publishing, and business organizations. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome David. Thank you very much. Well, that makes me sound good, doesn't it? <laughs> Let's watch a little clip first, and I'll explain what I do for a job. Good story? Yeah? Brilliant. Why do you think that's a good story? It's interesting, isn't it? We don't know why it's a good story. Who knows what a story is? Who can define a story? Something that happens. Something that happens? That's, you're probably as close as anyone's <laughs> ever been. You'll be relieved to know that you're in good company because the best academics of the last 2,400 years, going back to Aristotle, have been unable to agree a definition for what a story is. Right? So part of what I do is try and help people to understand where the power lies in their own stories. And the, the research I'm doing at university is to try and distill out the essence of what a story is and how they get their power. So just to give you a little glimpse of what I do, if you put the next slide down, I'm going to go through these top level basic things that explain what a story is. And then we'll watch that clip again and see if you can see the engine turning under the bonnet as we go through that story the second time. Yeah? So, what we're going to look for when we watch it the second time is a world thrown out of balance. Every story you ever see has usually a protagonist whose world is thrown out of balance, something goes wrong. It's, uh, um, Aristotle called it a harmatia, an error, a mistake, something's gone wrong. You need something to fix, right? Sorry? You need something to fix. That's right. So the question is raised for the protagonist, what's he going to do? How is he going to fix this? How is he going to bring his world back into balance? So 
Britain is being threatened by a psycho Dr. Evil from the other side of the world. Their world is thrown out of balance because there's going to be a bomb go off in a couple of days' time. James Bond has to fix it all. How is he going to do it? Question and break. How is he going to fix it? So there have to be obstacles in order to make the story interesting. He can't just go and fix it straight away. We need conflict. We need obstacles. Okay, so we're going to look for conflict. Every story, every good story tends to have conflict. They don't have to. Um, there's a Japanese type of story called Tishu, Ten, Tishu Tenketsu stories, which have no conflict. And I don't think they're very good, but they exist. <laughs> so we're looking for conflict, obstacles, things getting in the way. And then at some point, someone usually has a realisation that what they're doing isn't enough. Things are much worse than they thought they were and they're going to have to make extra effort. Things aren't going well, and they are either going to die tragically, or else they're going to have to really raise their game, or something's going to have to happen that we can't tell what it is, in order for this story to work out successfully, okay? Now that's a realization. And then there's a twist in the end. So you know what you want from the beginning. You know you want the good guy to win, but you don't know how he's going to win. And what you get from the realisation is you now have a full understanding of what he's up against. How is he going to win? And there's usually a, an option A and an option B. And to be a clever writer, you come up with secret option C, the twist in the tail that takes you to the ending you wanted, but not as you expected. Right? And then the world is taken back into uh, balance, and the question that was raised at the beginning is answered. Okay? You all got that? So if we go through the film again, no, no, not go back one. We're going to see a world thrown out of balance. We're going to look for conflict. Here we go. Shout out if you see any of those things. the earlier question, what is a story? This is my definition. A story is any form of information transfer which involves knowledge gaps in the delivery. We get anxious when we don't know something, when we think we have missing information. So when there's a bump in the night at three in the morning, you think, what was that? You've got missing information. And your brain goes crazy trying to fill that information. It's a story. And you need to fill those gaps before you can go back to sleep. You can't just say, whatever, go back to sleep. You need to fill those gaps. So what storytellers do is they give you gaps. That's what they give you. If you think a storyteller is telling you a story, what they're actually giving you is a whole range of gaps. And they alarm you, they alert you, to it. they excite you, they're an opportunity and they're a risk. That's what gaps mean to us. So when you think a storyteller, you think someone's telling you a story, they're not. You make a story in your own head from the information they do give you, which is the narrative. So the story is only ever built in your head. Right? So let me give you one more example before we have a chat. Um, I'm going to show you now a novel. 
This is a novel written by Ernest Hemingway. He bet his mates in the pub that he could write a novel in six words. And his mates took the bet, and he came back with this novel, which I'm going to show you. So have a look at this, and have a little think about it, and we'll see the difference in the information you're given and what you make in your head. So here's the shortest novel in the world. story. Or maybe the baby was born with wings and didn't need to choose. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Anybody else? Most people think it's a tragic story. It's a story of a baby that died. So you choose what it is. Other people who think the baby was born with sideline feet. <laughs> uh, the shoes they bought didn't fit. Four months. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the point is, what you get in your mind, whatever version you make of it, None of those words are in what you're talking about. Tragedy and disaster are not in the words you're given. You're given six words, and you make the story for yourself. So a storyteller gives you minimal information, they're just handing you lots of gaps, and then you build the rest for yourself in your mind. So stories are made from gaps in knowledge. Right? So I'm going to stop there. I could go on for two days with this stuff, because that's what I do in all my residential courses. But I'll stop there and uh, let Emma take the stage. Okay, great. Um, Should I come and sit down? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask him a few questions to David now. Now, it's great that we've seen what he does, but I thought maybe we could see how he got there in the first place. Um, so, writing and working creatively has obviously been a big part of your life. What got you there? Have you always been writing since you were a child? Um, I think. It all starts with a dream, doesn't it? Which hopefully all of you have got dreams. You know you want to go somewhere with your life, you want to do something, and you have imagination, you dream. That when I was growing up, I wanted to travel. That's all I wanted to do was travel. And I joined the Merchant Navy and I sailed around the world doing an apprenticeship on working on ships and traveling the world for about five years. And I used to come home from the ships and meet my friends and back in the day, there was no Snapchat or Facebook or anything. So I'd been away for six months. Nobody knew what I'd been up to. So I'd tell them the stories from where I'd been all around the world. And I would exaggerate to make myself look good or to make myself look terrible some of the time. And um, so it, the storytelling began from there. And I, I began making up nonsense for my friends and entertaining them, making them laugh from the stories around the world. And that's kind of where it started. And my first book that I got published was a travel book um, of stories of um, sailors around the world, which um, hopefully people find um, humorous. <laughs> so it's those stories. I started making stories up, telling them out loud to people, and it was from there that my first publishing deal came. So you started with the subject matter, your travels, and then worked back from there? I started with the journey, the genuine journey, and then exaggerated it yeah. and added a bit of magical fiction on the top to make it more entertaining. Yes, yes, I guess. But uh, mine were much more, lots and lots of short stories, smaller episodes, but yeah, yes. Were you reading a lot when you were younger? And if so, who were your favorite writers? Um, I used to read a very limited range. I read comedy. I liked comedy books, and, uh, and so I used to read a lot of comedy. And my favorite author was P.G. Woodhouse, um, who, it's quite interesting, really, because it was, um, I, I, he was a genius. Everyone says P.G. Woodhouse was a genius. He wrote 100 books. They're still for sale in the shops today. And you just accept that he's a genius. But that's actually doing him a disservice because um, I, I read everything he, he wrote. And they brought out a book by P.G. Woodhouse around the time he died that hadn't been published. It was one of his first, earliest works from when he was a very young man. And I thought, oh, some new Woodhouse to read. So I went and got it. And he, he wrote it when he was probably 18 or 20 years old. 
and it was really bad. And this man's my hero, I love him, and this is rubbish. And I thought, wow, he was rubbish. I'm rubbish. Maybe he just worked really hard. And he's not a genius, he's just really focused and really driven, and he became good through hard work and learning. It really inspired me, because I didn't feel I was the type of person who could be a writer. I didn't have that confidence. I thought that was a closed door to me. But realizing that he had been rubbish once upon a time and that he had become this great man, I felt empowered to follow that same path. So it gave me that inspiration that I needed, the belief, if you like, that I could do it too. How have your literary ch tastes changed over time? Who do you read now? <laughs> Um, I still read Woodhouse, I'm afraid. Yeah. I'll, t I'll take the same, just go around. He, he wrote 100 books, I'll just go back to the beginning again. But uh, I read a lot more. I've read a lot of um, Lee Child, obviously, since I met him. I feel I have to. Um, that's very good stuff. Um, I've read a lot of children's books. I've got four kids, so I, I read with them and go through all of those wonderful children's books, the Philip Pullmans, obviously J.K. Rowling, Dr. Zeus. It's fantastic, isn't it? Um, but mostly these days, I read scripts and uh, the things I'm working on pretty much take up all my reading time. So mostly it's um, unpublished mm -hmm. material and script evaluations these days, yeah. So career-wise, um, what do you think was your first big break? Which was the moment when you felt like, okay, I've made it and I'm where I want to be? Um, those two things were separated by a long time. Uh, writers don't earn a lot of money, certainly in the early part of their careers. Um, so the big break, I, I had a very good couple of years around the time I was about 30, and I got my first publishing deal, which were those stories from my travels. And I won a film story competition. Very good way of getting into the industry is by winning a competition. Suddenly you raise your profile above everybody else. Um, it's still going, it's called the Euroscript Film Story Competition. I put one of my stories in, and it, it got first prize in a Europe-wide competition. So at that point, I recognized, realized my stories were becoming good enough. So having been rubbish, Suddenly, I won a competition and I got a publishing deal, but I was, you know, 30, 31 by then, so it took a long time. And obviously, that doesn't hook into money. So when you talk about getting to where you want to be, which means being fully professional, not having to do anything else with your working day, that was a long time after that. Most, most people don't make money from books until they've got at least six out there and selling. So it's a very tough world um, to get rolling. You have to be very productive and very determined to keep going. Now you're undertaking the PhD at the moment, we were talking about that before, but what was your experience of early education like? How was school? Did you like it? Did you think it was important? Um, I do think it's important now. I, was, um, <coughs> I, w I actually didn't do very well at, at school. Um, I left with four GCSEs and went off travelling around the world. I actually ran away to sea like a proper romantic traveller would. Um, no, I, I was very susceptible to peer pressure when I was young, so I would do whatever I thought would impress the people I was trying to impress. So that was much more important to me than actually studying. And um, so, no, my, my early education was pretty, um, pretty, pretty poor. And um, I think peer pressure can be a big problem. And uh, it, once you get over it, your, your life improves dramatically. So uh, that was probably the best education was getting, getting past peer pressure. Okay, that's really fast, mm. always. Um, how did your family and friends respond to your ambitions when you were younger? When you wanted to go travelling, when you wanted to write, were they supportive of that? Um, not really, actually. They were very tied up with their own nonsense, you know, the divorcing parents and those sorts of things. So they were pretty much, and I was one of four children, so I was kind of left to my own devices. But they were horrified when I announced that I was going to sea. I was 16 years old and uh, I disappeared off on a ship and... Uh, they didn't have much say in the matter. So yeah, they were pretty horrified at that. Um, but basically, they're very lovely people who were a bit tangled up with other things at the time. So uh, I don't really hold it against them. Uh, but uh, yeah, the parenting wasn't great around that time. So I went off and made my own decisions that weren't necessarily best for them. Do you think you were always quite an ambitious young boy? Did you feel like that when you were younger? Did you have a sense that you wanted to succeed, to work hard? Or did that come on later? Very much later. I thought when I was young that I'd never ever be anything but very young and that as long as I was happy on the day, I was happy. So I didn't really think enough about the future. I certainly didn't plan 
I had dreams, so I say, to travel, and I was lucky that I was able to travel and fulfill that dream. I wanted to see a tropical island. I wanted to see New York and Australia, you know, and these ambitions are very, um, they're sort of, I don't know, they're not really ambitions, are they? They're, they're, they're fulfilling something, but they're not really career aspirations. Mm -hmm. And that certainly wasn't something I wanted to do for a career. So I left the Merchant Navy after five years once I didn't want to travel anymore. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I wasn't. I was very happy kicking a football all day and all night, and then the next day and the next night. Football was the thing for me, but I had no ambitions beyond being happy on the day, which isn't a bad thing for a kid, I suppose. Did it take courage for you to leave that, to leave the, when you decided to go and the travelling and then to say, no, I want to get out of that for five years? Was that difficult? It wasn't, um, because I was so shallow about things. I just swapped from one thing to another, and uh, that uh, it's not very clever. I wish I'd had a better focus, um, but at the time I was bored, so I stopped and went and did something else. I was going to be a rock star after that, and I yeah. became a musician for a while. So yeah, very much you know, being blown in the wind by my next fantasy. In terms of your early career and the people you were working with, were there people that helped you? And did you maybe have a mentor or someone like that in your life? Um, no, not really. As I say, um, that discovery about P.G. Woodhouse was a, an absolute bombshell for me mm -hmm. that, that I could even, even saying it now, saying something he wrote was rubbish. I can't, I can't say that about him, he was my hero. But to find out he was human, and that gave me the, that kind of empowered me to think I could do the same. Mm -hmm. That was probably a, the biggest moment where an adult kind of led me, if yeah. you like, even though he had no idea that's what he ever did. By writing something poor, he probably never even knew it was published, of mm -hmm. course. They came back and published it when it was worth money. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I didn't really know. That's a, and it does leave you without a sort of anchorage or without a direction, but uh, you do need that kind of guidance. Yeah. Yeah. And you've worked with lots of different types of people, and so you must have met difficult people and easier people. How have you approached um, working with more difficult people? Have you had that unfortunate experience happen? Um, I have, and I think one of the things that makes people become a writer is if they don't like confrontation and difficult people. Um, being a writer is a lone task. You sit on your own for a lot of the time, um, and you manage your own life. So if you imagine it as running a business, you don't work with anybody else. It's very much a, a personal, soul, isolated undertaking. So for me, it escapes from having to deal with other people and from having to face those kind of confrontational issues and difficult people. As a writer, you isolate yourself from that. And I think a lot of people become writers as a means of avoiding those things. So it might, you might think, oh, we're a writer, but they're actually avoiding those things in life. And they're, they're often very gentle people who make their point with a pen. And uh, so, yeah, if something makes me upset now, I'll write a letter to the Times about it rather than go and confront someone face to face, you know. Mm -hmm. So there is power there. You can do something about things. Um, but uh, you do it from, from a distance with a pen rather than um, facing up to someone. And you do lots of different types of writing. So you do like screenplays and you do mm. fiction and non-fiction. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the different fields that you work in and how they're different? What yeah. do you like prefer? Um, yes, it's not a good thing. I, when I'm advising writers, I advise them to be, to have a single genre, to have a brand which is them. You know, if you think of J.K. Rowling, you only think of one type of book. It doesn't matter what, what else she does. You know what you want from a J.K. Rowling book. You want Wizards and Hogwarts and those sorts of things. You don't want anything else. And so writing in different genres isn't a very clever thing to do from a career perspective. Um, I do it because it keeps me writing. I have different projects and I'm... You know, if I'm on the train home later, that's 20 minutes, and I could write a blog post or I could write a short piece, but I couldn't pick up all the threads of a piece of research or a novel or a screenplay. So by having different projects, I've always found myself able to find something that inspires me when something else is giving me problems. So I'll shelve that one and pick this one up and run with that one until that one's giving me problems. So you move very slowly in three or four different areas, but it means you've always got something inspiring, something to, to do. Mm -hmm. And which is your favourite genre? Um, it writing. does vary according to mood. Um, the humour material is great. I do love that. And I like the impact. You know, it's, it's nothing better than having someone tell you, someone you've never met from the other side of the world, getting in touch to say that you've made them laugh their head off, you know, and you don't even know who they are. That's fantastic. Um, so that sort of, the, the humour's great. I really like make, making people laugh. Um, but all of it, I love it all, just um, mood by mood, and obviously decade by decade as you become a different... Uh, 
different stage of life, you want to write different things. You know, at the moment, I'm very motivated by the research and developing these story theories and, and applying those. So um, that's where my heart is at the moment. That's what I want to write yeah. now. And how have you felt going back into the uni context? Because that must be quite relevant for anyone here. If you're applying to uni, if you're thinking about mm -hmm. different kinds of subjects or not, how have you found that? That's really interesting. As I say, I left with four GCSEs and now I'm doing a PhD. And as I said earlier, I don't, I didn't feel I had access to those things. I didn't feel I could be that person. So through the Merchant Navy, I got some qualifications in navigation and those sorts of things, which got me into a first degree. And from there, I've been able to take this on, uh, research degrees on from there. I've found it immensely empowering. And uh, education is such a great way of opening up the avenues for wherever your dream lies, where, whatever you want to do, doesn't matter what you want to be, whether it be you know, a nurse or a psychologist, IT professional, football, whatever you do, an education will keep doors open and will help you to get there. So it's fantastic. You think what we are, human beings, what distinguishes us from the beasts in the field, it's things like art and knowledge and education. It's these things that set us apart. And uh, certainly I've come to value that knowledge and you know a lot of my heroes are not the famous people I've met or the rich people I've met it's academics that I'd ne never have heard of if I hadn't gone back to university who've given me so much but nobody knows who they are yeah. fantastic yeah I love it do you feel like you've experienced any um, discrimination or prejudice in your life perhaps before your career really kicked off or maybe afterwards and if so how have you responded to that that's a very interesting question um, obviously I'm uh, white male middle class from the south of England. So, no, I'm, uh, I don't experience much discrimination except I support a football team and going along there is probably the worst it gets. Um, but uh, within the film industry, it, it's a terrible place. It's very, very poorly structured. Um, women do very badly in the uh, film industry at the moment. They are definitely discrimi discriminated against. Um, obviously, you've seen in the Oscars the paucity of black faces there. It's not right. Um, and the industry is still run to this day by white, middle-aged men. Yeah. And um, that nothing much has changed, you know, when there was a, a, um, a very um, famous academic article written in the late 80s by Laura Mulvey called The Male Gaze, and where she kind of exposed the film industry for what it does. It's a load of men making pictures for men to look at, you know, the male gaze. The camera is facilitating the male gaze. And she was right, and nothing much has changed. You know, we're beginning to get some women into the lower echelon, so we're getting a lot more writers now. A lot of, probably half the books that are written are written by women now, so that's not so bad. Directors, some of the film stories coming through from those books, so things like Hunger Games, you know, and Divergent. These things, are, uh, there are improvements. You're seeing the seeds of change, but only at that level. Yeah. Um, it'll take another generation, I think, before there are women sat around those decision-making executive tables uh, at the top of Hollywood, deciding where the money goes. And of course, those guys put the money where they think it should go, and they don't get it. Um, I remember, I've actually been in production meetings in Hollywood, and they, they know they have to do something about equality. And so they sit there and say, right, we have to do something. Let's empower this woman. So they sort of crowbar a woman character in. They say, how can we make her equal? We'll make her as good as a man. So they make her run as fast and beat men up and things like this. And you end up with something like Lara Croft, you know, where she's just, all she's doing is doing what men do as well as men do. But, of course, they still put her in a nice slinky cat suit with high heels, you know, and they, they think that's equality. Yeah. So, yeah, it's still the dark ages as far as Hollywood's concerned, and it'll take a while. But anyone wanting to go into the film industry, if you get into film school, there's equal opportunities at that level, yeah. and you can get plenty of, there are plenty of people working in sound and in, director of photography, directors, producers, there's, there's plenty of women there, but it's going to take a while for them to percolate up to the decision-making level. Really. I suppose it's the generation of the young people who start in this room who are going to change the world, yeah. and yeah. that's very exciting. And I suppose social media has a lot to say about that. How do you feel about social media? Do you think it's something that's revolutionising the film industry and writing? That's an interesting one. It's obviously revolutionising uh, communication, so... Probably, I imagine it gives people more access to the kind of individual who can be inspiring and you can see what they do and you can feel the sense that they are just people. Anything anyone does, you can do. It's 
people that do jobs, whatever they are. So there's nothing to stop anyone from getting anywhere if you try hard enough, you know. Um, so, yeah, presumably it has an impact and hopefully a positive one because the internet is, uh, doesn't discriminate, does it? And uh, if it does, then you get yourself into a lot of trouble, I suppose. So, no, in that way, it's uh, probably a good thing, yeah. Now, your industry is obviously very competitive, but in terms of specifically writing, what advice do you give to any young people here that might want to go into that mm. and are just starting out because it's been so daunting? Um, I get a lot of writers come to me for help, and a lot of the time, the main thing they need is confidence, self-belief. So they show me a story and say, is that any good? And I say, you tell me, it's your story. If you think it's good, then it's good. And that's the same for any artistic endeavor. You should be trying to satisfy yourself first and foremost. I say to them, who's the god of your story? All the people in the story world you've created, who is their god? You are. It's your world. You can do whatever you like. And it's very important that you write a story that satisfies yourself. If you let someone like me get involved, say, here you go, here's what I do, you know. I'm changing it. It's not your story anymore. And so you'd be disappointed. You should be disappointed with it, even if it got famous. That's not the point. So I would say as a writer, the, the, the writers I've met who have made it have terrific self-confidence, self-belief in their own product. They, it's right because they say it's right. And they're not going to compromise that. If a film company buys it from them and makes it in a different way to get commercial success, that's up to them. But the writer is going to stick to their guns and say, no, this is how it goes. This is the message I want to say. And the writers that are like that tend to be successful. The ones that turn circles trying to ask people whether it's any good or not end up getting it bent out of shape. So I would say believe in your story. If, it, if you think it's good, then it is. Send it off and get on with the next one. Send it to agents, producers, publishers, and you will get rejected hundreds of times. It's part of the game. And it, it's horrible. People don't like rejection, and they limit themselves to, to that fear of rejection. It's part of the game. Send it away, every rejection. Put it in the file. I've got a big file of rejections. And you, you'll be, look at that one day and think, if it wasn't for all those rejections, I wouldn't have got this one success. Because most artwork, I would say, is 90% bad and 10% good. And most artists need to put a big quality filter on what they do. Throw away no, the 90% that's no good. Keep that precious little nugget that's good. And if you're productive and produce enough, those 10% that are great build into a portfolio, build into novels or works of art, songs, paintings, whatever it is you do, that 10% that's great will define you. So be productive, work hard, do lots of it. Because most writers who fail are very, very slow. If you take five years to produce one piece of art, to get that one in 10 that's any good, you're looking at 50 years. Is my maths bad there? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So if you're producing, you know, what I say to writers is, what did you write today? You should be writing every day. And they say, well, no, you know, I'm busy. I've got this stuff to do. I'm going to take a year out. I want to go and sit on an island. So then I'm going, no, no, you've got to write every day. If you love it, you need to be productive. I say, can you write 500 words today? Could you do one side of A4? And I say, yeah, of course I can. I say, okay, go on then. Do that every day. And at the end of the week, you've got 3,000 words, right? At the end of a school year, three terms, taking Sundays off and three months off for holiday, you've got a 100,000-word novel in nine months. Polish it for three months, novel a year. So then in five years, you've got five novels, right? 500,000 uh, words. And publishers then begin to think, well, wow, here's someone who's not going to stop. And that one in 10, that one in 10 becomes a career. That, uh, that, that can define you. So work hard and believe in yourself and don't let anyone else bend you out of shape. Just keep doing what you do. If 1% of the world agrees with you that what you've done is good, that's more than a living. There's a lot of people out there. And if one in 100 will give you a couple of quid for it, you're making a very, very handsome living. Now, your role is obviously very varied. You do a lot of different things. What are the bits about your job that you love? What are the bits that you don't like so much? Um, I, I love most of it. Um, I love the writing bit, sitting on my own and then going to that other world um, where you're, you've defined a different world for yourself and you can go there by sitting in a space and by writing. Because you write slowly, the world fills in in your mind. So if you can put yourself in a quiet place and sit and write, you can go to that place. And I love that, going to that fictional world and living there, getting behind the character's eyes, making them do stuff. Because you're the god of that story. You can make it all happen. So I love, I love that bit. 
Um, what don't I like? I don't like um, the spade work that you have to do, selling, marketing, those sorts of things. I find it embarrassing. I, I'm quite shy and I'd rather sit at home and write, but of course you can't sell anything unless you um, go and sell it. So you tend to have to do those things if you want to be part of the whole arrangement. And again, the most successful artists I meet, um, whatever sphere of art they're in, are the ones who are prepared to go and sell themselves, the ones who are prepared to get out there and, um, and make the most of their art on the commercial side. Um, as a writer, send it off, just send it to agents, get hold of the Writers and Artists Yearbook, a big list of uh, publishers and uh, agents, producers, send it all off, then write the next one. And uh, when the rejections come, just laugh at it and you're already busy with the next one, so you don't care. In the end, one of them will hit and then you're away. Fantastic. How do you find that mix between the commercial and the creative? Do you think sometimes that's a difficult pairing? Or? It's a very annoying pairing. So, for example, you know, I, I, I sell enough books, but someone like David Beckham or Katie Price, they sell a lot more books than me, right? They're top authors as far as the world is concerned. Jamie Oliver, look at that. The book sales are phenomenal. Celebrity sells books. So a lot of writers don't want to be famous. They like writing and they like that background position. And I feel that way. But if you don't make a name for yourself, the chances of making a living are very, very difficult indeed. So you kind of have to accept that it goes with the territory. If you want to be a writer, you will have to put yourself out there to some extent or another. Um, you know, J.K. Rowling makes more money from two other things apart from book sales. Book sales are the third biggest earner for her. Anyone know what the other two might be? Merchandise is the top one. She makes more from merchandise than anything else. And then secondly, she makes her money from um, film rights. And thirdly, book sales. And she's a billionaire author, so she's doing all right, isn't she? So yeah, the marketing side is very uh, annoying if you don't want to do it. But for people who like that stuff, it's great. <laughs> of your work, what's the thing you feel most proud of that you've done? Wow. Um, I'm proud of, it, it's, it's interesting really, because obviously you, you, uh, there's nothing like going into a bookshop and seeing your name on the, on the spine of a book in a bookshop, you know, W.H. Smith somewhere, or I saw uh, my book on an, uh, in an airport bookshop in America. You know? That's amazing, that's a really wonderful feeling. And seeing someone read one of your books randomly, so I saw a woman reading one of my books on a beach in Greece, I, and she's reading my book, can you imagine, it's fantastic. And I, went, I wanted to go and talk to her, and I thought, I can't, I can't. And uh, my family was like, go on, go on, go and say hello, you know. I said, what can you do? You go over and say, do you know who I am? You know? <laughs> They're all a bit spooky, isn't it? And they make their children cry and stuff. But we did actually meet them, and uh, they go to that Greek place. So we've, we've actually made friends with them now. But that was great, you know. So, yeah, it's all, it's all great. But I think the best, the thing I'm most proud of is turning things down, funnily enough. Um, I've got four kids and a family and I get opportunities particularly to go to Los Angeles to work and I turn them down because I want to go home in the evening and I like to be happy in my day so I turn down some bigger money if you like and I turn down glamorous opportunities because I'd rather do what makes me happy which is to sit in a room and write yeah. so I turn things away and I'm proud of that that takes some doing but I look back and think no that was good I was at home when my kids were young and those sorts of things that's those are probably the best things for me Um, I think I, I wish I'd started, I wish I'd got my head around it earlier. So I'd got, uh, as I say, I didn't really get anywhere until I was my early 30s because I didn't understand that I was allowed to be myself and to believe in myself and this stuff was valid, you know. I could do this. And I didn't really get my head around that for a very long time. Um, so I would certainly try and work harder from earlier with that belief that it would actually get somewhere. I didn't really, I just told the story and thought it was funny, but I didn't really believe it could go anywhere. So yeah, I would certainly work harder from much earlier in my life. And I would focus on one thing. I say, I tell other writers, you've got to have a brand, you've got to be one type of writer. You know, Lee Child brings out one book a year, every year, has done for 20 years now, and they're all a Jack Reacher book, year after year after year, and uh, he's massively successful. Whereas I do this one day and this the next. So yeah, have one brand that defines you and stick with that to a greater extent. I would change, I would do that. And if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing instead? Hmm. 
That's very hard to know. Um, I don't know. I think I'd probably be... Actually, I, I, my first degree, which I went back for in my late 20s, was an IT degree, of all things, in the back there. That's the variety that's in there. So some of my first professional writing was as a technical writer. I would write manuals and service guides and sort of technical uh, manuals. And I really enjoyed that. That was, that, was, that was an easy way to make money in the computer industry, as far as I was concerned, um, from writing technical manuals. So I, I guess I'd be doing that. And what do you think it is that keeps you motivated throughout your career? What's kept you going with that? Oh, uh, deadlines. <laughs> it's one of the best things for a writer. It's very easy when you're writing a novel to think about it and have another day thinking about it, another year thinking about it. If you've got a deadline, deadline, deadline yeah, yeah. Well, so it's one of the best things about getting published is that you, they tell you, this is, this, the print run is this day. The marketing people need this lot by this time and you have to have it out by then because you've got to do, you know, deadlines are great because your novel is probably above the bottom line a lot earlier than you thought it was, but you're not sure and you can keep working it forever. So I think deadlines are the best thing, especially for me, because I would stand turning circles forever if they let me. Um, so I'm on to my, back on to my last question, and I'll, then we're going to stop, and you can ask any questions that you'd like. I'll open that up to get thinking about that. And then we're going to have some refreshments, and you can chat with David a little more casually to think about that. Um, so what key pieces of advice would you give to our audience now on how to achieve their goals and their success, whether it's writing or something totally different? And how do you think they should go about setting in their career path with their goals in mind? That's very interesting, isn't it? Um, I thought about this because I was told you were going to ask this. I'm going to get my notes so I get this right. I think it's really important. I, I think this is really important question. Probably best one of the day. <laughs> um, what did I write down? Right. So. As I said earlier, we all begin with a, a dream, a seed. We have a, something we would like to do with our lives. It doesn't matter what it is, whether you want to be a banker or a footballer or a musician or a psychologist, it doesn't matter. If you have that passion, if you can find out what you want to do, where your heart would take you if you had completely free freedom to do anything you liked, what would that be? So once you know what that is, whatever it is, then you just have to become expert at it. And that is open to most people, if you think about it. But we get so many pressures, it's very hard to sift out what that thing is. But when you find it, then if you become really good at it, the money will come. Lots of people think about what they want, and they think, oh, I want fame, or I want money, or whatever it might be. Find out what your heart wants to do with its day. I know what I want to do. If they didn't give me any money, I'd still write. You know, and I'm very lucky to have that. And if you have something you know you want to do, then you can you, you, you let your heart go. And that can be very bad advice for some people because they, you have to then be realistic. So the second thing you have to overlay on top of that, so that's your heart, you then have to use your head to guide it. So you have your passion, you know what you want to do, then you have to be realistic. And that means the secret of success. I'm going to tell you the secret of success, and that is to work harder than anybody else who's trying to do the same thing. So if you want to be a musician, or a guitarist, or a singer, or an artist of some sort, you're entering a very, very difficult field. So working harder than everyone else is much harder, because there's a lot more people all trying to achieve the same thing. So to be realistic, you have to decide in yourself if you have the stomach for that level of hard work, even though it's something that you quite interests your heart. So it's all, for me, it's all about following your heart, but guiding it with your head. If you become expert at that thing, you will have success, and uh, it, whether money, the money will follow to some extent, because if you become an expert at something, you will get money, but follow your heart, guide it with your head.
Um, you're exactly right. Um, there's a, it's that balance between art and commerce that um, Emma was talking about earlier. Um, the business side of things are looking for, to put things in a, in a box. They need a genre. They need you to fit something. Yeah. Usually, don't they? They, they, you have to fit a box or you can't get the deal. So on the commercial side, things get bent out of shape. Like I say, as a writer, you write something, and then if you sell it, they bend it out of all recognition, and it can be quite upsetting because your heart's gone into that. Um, but the best artists I ever meet probably won't get anywhere because they won't fit themselves into that management context. So would you say with a, pro you say a project and then the producer here and the studio there and whatever, that everyone calls it left, right, and centre, would you stay with any guidance or will you say, I've done my deal, this is my payout by amount, I'm gone, you do what you want? Uh, yeah, I, it's, it is certainly the position I find myself in within the context of a movie. I, I can't make those decisions and it can be very frustrating. So I have my name attached to something that someone else then breaks as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, exactly. But I, I try and make my point. I try and coerce and negotiate and justify why I'm saying it should be a certain way. But ultimately, I'm not the decision maker on the project. So yeah, I'm in a frustrating position in the film industry in particular. And the people with the money often don't have a clue. And the vast, vast majority of projects I work on fall apart. People get paid. Um, writers get options, you can get a lot of money. Lee Child, funny enough, uh, famously has made a million dollars from options that have never been converted into film. So they pay him an amount to own the rights to his story for say a year, 18 months, then they argue with each other for a year, 18 months, and then he gets it back. So he gets the rights back to the story, they've given him half a million dollars or whatever, and he can sell it again. And he made a million dollars from, from selling the same thing his film eventually only got made a couple of years ago, that first Jack Reacher one, after decades of having it well, optioned. Because somehow it landed on cruises. On cruises, yeah. That's right. And, and he um, cast himself as a six foot seven um, army dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he cast himself. Yeah. He owned the rights to the film and cast himself in it. Yeah. So, no, it's a very frustrating. Any collaborative art tends to involve fair amount of frustration when you're talking earlier about difficult people yeah I suppose I do encounter them but um, because it's not my my baby I have to be diplomatic and and fit round and as I say I make my point make sure I've made my point but ultimately I have to take what they do so there have been a couple of films I've said I don't, I don't want my name attached to it so thank you for the money but I don't want people to think that I was involved in what you're going to put out you know were you Alan Smithy? <laughs> I am not which? Were you Alan Smithy on it? Did you take Alan Smithy on it? I don't know what that means. That means I'm dropping this project, but I, everyone knows you know I write this, he knows I write this, you oh, know I write this. Alan Smithy is a pseudonym? Yeah, right, I okay. No, I didn't know that. I've um, not worked with a pseudonym, but I've worked with people who don't want the world to know they have a story consultant. That's so I, I get paid. It's, it's for you, it's for right. others. It's yeah. for a, a Right, I didn't know that. I get paid, but my name's not attached. Um, and there are famous people who don't want the world to know that I'm attached to things. Um, which, that's fine, I'm happy with that, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Some of it is cynical, you've got money to earn uh, bread and butter stuff. Um, some of it, it, your heart goes into it. You know, I've, I work a lot with aspiring writers. I'm working with a, a competition called Enter the Pitch. Uh, anyone can enter it, enterthepitch.com, and it's wonderful, it's free to enter. You put together a two minute story, and if it's inspiring enough, you'll get through to the next round. If you get into the Last 10, you get a residential course with me, you lucky people. And then if you're in the last three, you get a prize, you get money, and your film will get made. A short film will get made, and they take it to Hollywood in the autumn and try and sell it to the studios. So I love that. I absolutely love it. I work with aspiring writers, mostly younger people, and someone, one of them, um, they all get to go to Pinewood Film Studios where they have the big announcement. It was just two weeks ago, actually. And one of them gets to go to Hollywood with their, with their film and, and sell it. And that's for free. Two minute pitch got uh, Vanessa, the girl who won a couple of weeks ago. And working with that where people are all sincere and where the whole thing is wonderful. And then they go to that's great. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so enter the, enter the pitch .com. Look it up. Any questions? Uh, I know a lot of musicians do that. Uh, one thing that I've seen in them is they don't like reading, like reading in general or reading uh, about their education field and like that. Um, so, what advice can you give? Uh, to somehow encourage these students to read, either in 
general or relate the education to it? Because if they don't read, they won't be able to learn. Mm. Uh, they will be able to turn a thousand like an ask you how to do That's really interesting. I, I've got a few tactics for that, and I get them because I was the same, even though. These days, obviously, the internet gets blamed and social media and the, the short form everyone wants to read. It's very short form at the moment. Um, but I was like, I didn't have the patience for books when I, was, when I was young. So my answer to that is, firstly, short stories, obviously. There's millions and millions of short stories that are fantastic. So read short stories. Um, what I do with my kids is I read books with them. And obviously, if you read uh, like bedtime stories, it's only going to be 10 or 15 minutes. But I don't read a chapter. I stop halfway through a chapter. So I read from halfway through a chapter to the next point where they really want to know what happens next. Guess what? They read it for themselves. And after two or three chapters of the same book, they want to read the whole book. So it is difficult, um, but they're, they're, those are two tactics that I use. Um, sometimes you can help people into literature through, through the movie, see the film of the, of the book. And uh, it can interest them in, under, in understanding the roots of that film and how they vary from, from the book. Um, so yeah, short form. Obviously, there's loads and loads of, um, of writing you can do in short form now. So trying to encourage younger people to write, contributing to blogs and, and things like that can, can help. But uh, it does seem to be going that way, doesn't it? And if you look at short films on, on the internet, there's millions and millions of them. And they, none of them make any money, but everyone makes short films short films and there's becoming a massive, almost an industry of short films because people want to watch them. They don't even have the patience for a two hour movie, let alone spending a, a, a couple of weeks reading a book. So it's uh, shorter forms are getting more and more common. So you can sell oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's the thing, you know, with Kindle books, you, if you write something that's any good, you can publish it yourself. You have a global audience, seven billion people in, in theory have access to it. So like I said earlier, it becomes a numbers game where you've only got to make a couple of pence from 1% of the people who you could stumble across it, and suddenly there's turnover there, financial turnover, yeah, absolutely right. I sell more books through my blog, um, so I tweet that I've written a blog post, I've got 35 or 40,000 Twitter followers, a proportion of those go and read the blog, and a proportion of those buy the book. So more than the publishers do, I, I write a blog post, tweet it, and there's a spike in book sales. And uh, if the pricing's right, it's all linked up on the internet, and there it goes. Well, they, they, they probably, I think sometimes it's the other way around, because they gave, they, the deal I did with my publishers on the, on the best book, um, they didn't see the future of the internet, and they gave me the electronic rights. So I own all the electronic rights, even though they published the actual book. Okay, so any final questions? No? Okay, we'll leave it there. So thank you very much everyone for coming, and thank you to David for coming again, and just have a great afternoon. Thank you.